We're just gonna have to get used to Anthony Davis acting like the stock market. How is the NBA reacting to UCLA's draft prospects? And did you know, speaking of UCLA, that their spring football practice is finished? I didn't. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. It is May 6, 2023. It is Galaxy Game Day. Lots to talk about with regards to LA sports. And if you enjoy being in the know about LA sports, clickety-clack the like button. Clickety-clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell. Hit that. It'll let you know when we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And by all means, comment. Lots to cover today. Lots to discuss. So, before we go through the news and the notes, let's look at the scoreboard. Yesterday, straight up, Dodger bats went silent. San Diego defeats LA 5-2. Dodgers only got four hits. So, let's just turn the page on that and go to today. Golden State at the Lakers at 5-30. Game three of the best of seven series. The series right now tied 1-1. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in just a moment. Dodgers at San Diego, 5.40 p.m. Dustin May is 3-1 with a 3.15 ERA versus Blake Snell, 1-4 with a 5.28 ERA. Now look, everybody in the press wants to overreact about Dodgers Padres, whether the Dodgers win or lose. I would like to remind everybody out there that the Dodgers are on a pace to win 96 games. So let's not freak over just one game. Colorado is at the Galaxy at 7.30 p.m. Who's worse, right? The two t clubs have combined for just two wins in 19 matches. Off the pitch, this is actually going to be the first match where one of the five Galaxy supporters groups will abandon the boycott to oust club president Chris Klein. Crazy little night over at Dignity Health Sports Park ahead despite the fact that everybody is gonna to try to show up wearing Star Wars gear. That's great, but whatever. Uh, LAFC is at San Jose at 4.30 p.m. Here's an interesting little tidbit. We all know Zlatan Ibrahimovic scored a lot of goals against LAFC, but who in terms of goals is the number two villain for the black and gold? Jeremy Abobise of the, Qu of the Quakes. He scored six times against them in 10 matches. But let's get back to the Lakers. Since game two, the Warriors were really playing up that spot start that they gave to Michael Green. And honestly, I just don't buy it all that much. Yeah, they kept a little bit of height on the court, but the man only played 12 minutes. What kind of an impact is that? Here is something though that I did not anticipate happening. Draymond Green actually was an effective member of the team on the court. He was one assist shy of a triple-double in Game 2. Yeah, it was just 11 points, but he had 11 rebounds and 9 assists, so he was facilitating a lot for the Warriors in Game 2. Having mentioned those little factoids, in my opinion, you cannot look away from the clear lack of aggression from the Lakers. One of the big numbers, one of the big tells, is that in game one, they attempted 29 free throws. Game two, they shot 11 fewer, which means that they weren't attacking the rim, that they weren't forcing the refs to make a decision when they were getting slapped around underneath the hoop because they weren't being aggressive underneath the hoop. Yesterday in the clip, I was mentioning how hypersensitive that the local and the NBA press are, how they want to drag you along with their personal tales of, of woeful instability. And it's not just the written press, it's most definitely the broadcasters. If the ESPN halftime show replaced their analysts with Demi Lovato, Sinead O'Connor, Kanye West, and Mariah Carey, could you really tell the difference between those four and what they have now? Exactly. Consider Bill Plaschke though, the LA Times shining example of mental imbalance. Game one, his story, the headline, Anthony Davis silences the critics. Game two, just two days later, Bill Plaschke's headline, LeBron James and Anthony Davis face a harsh reality. 
Gee, guys, nothing bipolar about that at all. Not a thing. That's stable. I've got to tell you, I look. if you've seen these clips for a while, you know that I look at things a little differently. Here's something a little different. That loss in game two was Anthony Davis's 20th consecutive game. That is the first time he's played 20 consecutive games since the Orlando bubble. What happened in the Orlando bubble? They won the ring. What happened without Davis at all for the last few years? Exactly, exactly. So the Lakers are in a significantly better position that is the harsh reality everybody has to face. It's the Lakers with Anthony Davis who actually have a legit shot at going to the NBA Finals. So I would tell you to expect a more aggressive LeBron James and Davis for a number of reasons. It's not just by being at home, it's not just by being in game two, but because they are also rested. Davis went from playing 45 minutes in game one to playing just 36 in game two because of the decisive nature of the Warriors' victory. LeBron James, he played only 29 minutes in game two. I'm not suggesting that you're gonna see the type of ass kicking that the Lakers laid on Memphis in game three. LA took Memphis's trash talk personally. They just didn't say it. Golden State is not that immature to give the Lakers a bunch of bulletin board material, but focused, much more driven, at the, in front of the home court? Yeah, I would expect that. James said as much after game two, especially saying that he still believes in the Lakers' defense. Said coach Darvin Ham, I fully anticipate our team to respond in the right way, unquote. And I, I believe him. I absolutely believe him. Tiger Campbell has been invited to the NBA G League Combine. The plus side? Tiger Campbell gets to show what he has in front of a bunch of NBA scouts. The downside, does this mean they think he's G League material only, right? Because there is an NBA draft combine, you just have to be invited to it. Former UCLA players Jaime Jaquez Junior and Amari Bailey, they're already invited to that one. Scouts at the G League combine they have to put in a good word for you in order to join, in order to cross the velvet rope to get into that party. So Tiger Campbell does still have a shot to go to the NBA Draft Combine and hopefully be impressive enough to latch onto a regular NBA team. But even if Campbell doesn't get invited to the NBA Draft Combine, it doesn't mean that he should consider an exciting new career as a middle manager at a Walmart. It doesn't mean his career is over. Last offseason, former UCLA guard Jules Bernard, he was invited to the G League Combine. He didn't get drafted, but he did sign with the Detroit Pistons. Now, Detroit sent him to their G League affiliate, but he still has a career, and he still has a shot at the NBA. So there's that. Meanwhile, two other former UCLA players aren't expected to showcase in any way. They're not going to a combine. They're not necessarily being invited for individual workouts because they can't. Jalen Clark can't. The man had Achilles surgery. How are you gonna jump or run without Achilles that's been fully healed? Adam Boda had surgery to repair a shoulder labrum. You're not gonna be lifting your arm up over your head to grab rebounds or shoot. So that's their story, but they are still eligible to go to the NBA. So that is more or less what's going on with UCLA basketball, with one exception that I have to get out of my system. I really don't like to tell adults how to live their lives unless crime is involved, right? You really don't want your male going to jail. But I wonder if Amari Bailey is really doing the right thing by declaring for the NBA draft. And by the way, his family is insisting that he is not going to return to UCLA. He's not gonna pull out of the draft and return to school. Here's my rationale. Bailey is projected to go in the late first, early second round. Anyone else think because of that, if he had stayed another year in Westwood, that he could be a lottery pick? Think about it. That extra year at UCLA, he would be the unquestioned leader of a national power. The offense would flow through Amari Bailey instead of simply being a cog 
in, you know, with a veteran team where most of the shots still go to Jaime Jaquez Jr. He would be the new Jaime Jaquez Jr., only with a much more varied, much, much more, he wouldn't just be a guy who, you know, shoots Jays. He would be driving to the hoop. He would be doing all sorts of other things that would intrigue NBA scouts. Now, I mentioned all that stuff about UCLA basketball. I want to add that over at USC basketball, Drew Peterson was also invited to that G League combine. Did you know that UCLA's spring football practices have ended? Like I said, I didn't. And this really bugs me. The Bruins football program is cloaked. It is spy versus spy. It is clandestine behavior. And it bothers the hell out of me a lot. Now, I'm not saying you got to open up the playbook for me, but, but show us something. Try not to make everything about your program look like it's the Mueller report from a few years ago. I'd even say that Chip Kelly's commitment to keeping things so hush-hush is one of the reasons that the Bruins have struggled to draw fans to the Rose Bowl. You're not in the news. People don't talk about you. So why are people all that fascinated about buying a ticket, right? This is a frayed relationship between UCLA football and its fan base. Look, consider the differences of spring practices. The major programs, they would hold a spring football game. They would either sell a couple of tickets or open it to the public. The major programs drew like 50,000, 60,000. USC drew 35,000 to the Coliseum. Colorado, which stinks. They hired Deion Sanders and because Deion Sanders has that flash, who's Coach Prime, they drew 45 to 46,000 people at their stadium to see what the New Look Buffaloes would look like. What did UCLA do? They had a spring practice on campus and the LA Times suggested that fewer than 50 people, 50 people showed up. And by the way, those 50 people, they watched it from atop a parking structure. Yeah. And those 50 people were monitored. They were watched by UCLA people making sure that those fans did not use their cell phones for pictures. For Pete's sake, guys, they were just wanting to take selfies. This was not corporate espionage. But that's the way Chip Kelly runs things. As a side note, I want to congratulate the LA Times for picking up on something I've been saying for an entire year about this program. This football team thinks it's MI6. They think Ian Fleming drew up the playbook. Now look, the Times has had some interesting quotes and developments, right? So I give them credit for at least trying to unearth something that we can go with about this team. While quarterback does appear to be a battle between last year's backup, Ethan Garbers, and the elite recruit, Dante Moore, tight end Maliki Mat Matavo said that the freshman quarterback, Moore, is, quote, the next big thing coming out of college. Guarantee it, unquote. The Times also agrees with me with something I threw out there a couple of days ago that there appear to be questions on the offensive line. The writer used the word thin to describe the state of their offensive line. CBS Sports rated all 32 uh, NFL teams best offseason to worst. And your LA Rams, my LA Rams, came in buck naked last. We had the worst offseason, according to CBS Sports. Now, nobody got you an F, the Rams got a D. For that matter, so did the Chargers. But the Rams were listed after all other teams. So it wasn't alphabetical, which means as far as their judgment was concerned, the Rams were the worst. Now, if you want to say the Rams had the worst offseason, build a case. I don't have a problem with people saying that. But the writer of this piece, a dude named Cody Benjamin, whose mugshot looks like he should tip much better the next time he gets a haircut... Couldn't even do that right. Quote, like the Buccaneers, the Rams are simply paying for all of their short-sighted spending, unquote. Short-sighted? They won a Super Bowl. They went to two Super Bowls. How many teams that you think had a much more responsible offseason would love to have that as part of their history? 
Who thinks the Rams would have won the Super Bowl two years ago without Matthew Stafford or Jalen Ramsey? Who? Tell me. Show me. Who thinks that would have happened? I t who thinks Tampa Bay, he was clowning Tampa Bay, who thinks Tampa Bay would have won a Super Bowl without Tom Brady? Totally willing to listen. Somebody let me know. Former Rams backup quarterback Bryce Perkins is still a free agent, but the guy who started at LA, uh, for LA against Kansas City has at least been invited to a rookie camp with the NFL's New York Giants. Rookie camp. He's not a rookie. So I have no idea if this guy is even getting paid for showing up. I will say this. The XFL does have a history of former Rams quarterbacks. Ask Luis, per Luis Perez. I mentioned a moment ago that the Chargers get a D grade from CBSSports.com. The writer did admit that if the Chargers do complete a, quarter, uh, a contract extension with quarterback Justin Herbert, that the Bolts would get a better grade. The Dodgers have a prospect who is looking like a stone-cold killer at double-A. Pitcher Emmett Sheehan, he was kind of meh with Boston College, a 4.80 ERA. But with the Dodgers in their minor league system, he has struck out 35 of 78 batters. You've heard of the stat strikeouts to innings ratio? That is a ratio of 16.3. He's a killer, an assassin. We'll see what happens for his career. The Dodgers also gave a spot start to Gavin Stone earlier this week, and honestly, it didn't go well. Dodgers bloggers are trying to spin it, but you can't. You have to be honest. That was a bad outing. It doesn't mean he's a failure, but it might mean that he needs more time in the minors. Turns out giving Stone a look, though, had an additional reason. Maybe Noah Syndergaard doesn't lose his spot in the rotation. This gave Syndergaard extra time off to work on his mechanics. They're calling it a reset. Which I have to tell you, I love the Dodgers, been a fan of the team since I was a kid. It's one thing that I can't stand about the current iteration of Dodger management. They spin things like politicians. Only politicians use the word reset. Fans have been asking why the primary Dodger announced team of Joe Davis and Oral Hershiser appear to have split. The LA Times went to the front office, got a relatively simple answer. There is no split. Davis has become a hot property. And if you ever hear Dodger broadcast, you know that guy has skills. He's incredible. His contract is limited to 90 Dodgers broadcasts per year. So they've been flipping announcers around to fill in the gaps. There is a website called Evolving Hockey. They're analytics guys. Now, part of analytics is to determine what a player could be worth. They believe King's free agent Gabriel Velarde is worth about $4 million a year now, just from one really strong year. How does this matter for the Kings? Well, at the end of the season, the Kings were said to have about $2.5 million in cap space. As it stands right now, though, there are only 18 players under contract. Cap projections have been revised. So LA has $7.5 million in cap space. So say you give Velarde his $4 million a year contract. Now you only have, only have 3.5 million left. So where do you go from there? The Kings have a blog or a Kings fan has a blog called Hockey Royalty. Right-handed defenseman Sean Walker didn't say he expects to be traded. And if he did get traded, the Kings wouldn't get much of anything back. Not at all. But they would get cap space. They would get cap space. Two and a half million on top. And by the way, they do have to move somebody on the back line. They have a glut of right-handed defensemen. The writer suggested trades for other players, but we are going to uh, look away from that because those are all predictions or hopes. There's not a lot of reason to believe Rob Blake would actually buy in to trading, say, a Victor Arvidsson. There's not a lot of reason to buy that. Mo Hassan, who seemed like a pretty good soldier for USC's football team, is the Third string quarterback, he went to social media and said that he has joined the Tennessee Titans, although Tennessee didn't announce it. There is a reason that you have to be reminded that he actually was on the Trojans program, though. It's because he never played. He kept getting injured. Even as a fifth-year senior, the guy blasted out his Achilles during off-season workouts, wound up missing the entire season. But let me know what you think in the comments thread. What 
are the, if I, it's not Anthony Davis, what do the Lakers have to do? Uh, what did you think of the Dodgers Padres in game one? And if you enjoyed talking LA sports with me, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking LA sports every day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back later today with a Galaxy Rapid Recap. Faithful Angelinos is a key on Corta El Queso production. Take care.